Today is November 19th, 2023. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki Naganago Mekoche Chestakom Aki or Dikots Nagotine Siku. My name is Red Thunder Woman. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders and members have been so kind to me on my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Blackfoot, and Leonard Kenny taught me how to pronounce my name in Satu Dene. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot and Dene elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Great Bear Lake tribe in Treaty 11. My people wore rabbit skin, so it's been referred to as the land of the hair people. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Kincho Tine Indahe in Satu Dene, meaning many big dog town, named after the Calgary Stampede. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot and Mokinstis is Michelle Elliott, an English name, which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene, or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post status card by the Canadian government says I'm Yellow Knives Dene. So through my father, I'm a daughter of the Mayflower and a daughter of the American Revolution, while having a Canadian Indian Act and Post status card. That is a colonial construct by Canadian policies meant to divide Indigenous peoples' inherent rights, Indigenous Two-Spirit or the Indigenous Two SLGBTQ community and Indigenous women are at the bottom of the Canadian socio-economic ladder because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. According to the 2023 Quality of Life report by the Calgary Foundation, 31% of racialized Calgarians cannot find suitable employment. In other words, racism! <laughs> I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous. I just share my journey as I go. As a Dene woman who has attempted to run, join harmful colonial parties, spent money to be at expensive conventions, left my home to travel to those conventions just to vote on incomplete policies that still allow for incarceration, child theft, a denial of, just, a denial of justice, denial of health services, racism, colonial trauma, and genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples, I have worked to continue reports to advocate for and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I think of all of this today as I hope we honour the many Indigenous lives lost for the so-called country named Canada. I hope you all see your role in the importance of stopping harm as a citizen, see your role as a treaty partner in reconciliation. Pride Month should never be one month. It is important to understand that the straight agenda and gendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. Now new religions are just adding to it. Anyway, land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous peoples, as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. So it's important that land acknowledgements have meaning. I encourage all people to introduce themselves with an acknowledgement of their ancestors, story of displacement, how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee or other land displacement, so we as Indigenous peoples know how safe you are to be around. If you won't sit, pronounce your local Indigenous nations' names, won't say your pronouns, won't say your story of origin, won't acknowledge stolen lands, um, economic oppression, or your role in reconciliation, I determine how safe you are to be around my community, my family, and myself. Understanding land acknowledgements and their importance is Indigenous 101 because it immediately addresses colonialism, oppression dynamics, broken treaties, and lies taught today in Canadian schools nationally. That's why settlers and those who call themselves native Calgarians or whatever town you're from, you show me you have no Indigenous 101 understanding. Jesse's Winty's book, Unreconciled, is just great at explaining this, as are many other Indigenous authored books. Land Back is a movement that could save the planet from climate change created by colonialism, but it also be part of a treaty partnership, part of meaningful reconciliation, and honoring global initiatives like the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Blackfoot South and the imposed U.S.-Canadian border are the Blackfeet, and north of the border are the Siksika, Gainai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands are Treaty 7, signed September 22, 1877, with signatures that included the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Stony Nations, the Good Stony, 
uh, Chiniki and Bearspaw chiefs, and the Dene from Sutina. I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands, all non-Indigenous or treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. I do not receive funding from anyone. This is a total, if you hear something and you think it's worth a dollar, five bucks, instead of like wanting to spend my time at a, at a coffee, why don't you just give me five bucks for a coffee? Um, but I do want to thank my previous donors for showing your support. Um, for folks who might be new, uh, about a year ago, no, two years ago now, sorry. Um, we were in a really tough uh, position and I put a call out and people saved our butt and uh, we were able to move back to Calgary on a on a moment moment's notice. But it, it was really hard for us financially. I th thought there was a time we were gonna, we were done for. <laughs> but it was thanks to my listeners and thanks to my followers that I'm here right now listen, or just talking to you. So when I say thank you to my previous donors, I wish you knew how much I appreciated your help then. And I hope that if anyone values what you're hearing or watching my videos, and if you can afford to give, thank you. For those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or your questions. You can also give a review, whatever medium you're listening from. I would love to remind you all too that... Um, I get lots of comments, I get lots of reviews, and I get lots of negativity because settler racism uh, is something that people are actively doing to try to erase us and discourage us. So if you like what you're listening to and you can't afford to give, I do mean it when I say a, a positive review helps. Um, you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can go to nativecalgarian.com for any of the past podcasts and, and you can go on any of my social media as well. So today is a really special one. I'm actually going to encourage folks who may not normally watch me on YouTube to consider doing it just for this presentation alone. And then uh, I'll under I'll try to talk through it for my podcast listeners who are like, I'm driving to and from Airdrie. I cannot watch your presentation, lady. <laughs> so uh, first and foremost, folks, I just wanted to give you some background. So I um, was lucky enough on Tuesday to be invited to um, this community gathering. It was historic. And I don't take my role as a witness it, uh, in a mi minority way. It, it's a really important role as Indigenous people that we honor what we witness. And I, I think that this was worth uh, a whole podcast towards. So uh, I'm going to start by um, sharing with you my friend, um, Sandra, who I have permission to share all of this with in fact the opposite she wanted me to and I asked her if she wanted to come on the podcast and just didn't seem like she like she's so busy all the time that she can't do things like that so so what am I talking about today today I'm going to talk about the Medicine Hills uh, Medicine Hills for folks who are from central Alberta they might know that as a ski slope I literally grew up in Sylvan Lake and never heard of the Medicine Hills ski slope so if you uh and, and you'll see it a little bit on my presentation here. If you're from the Sylvan Lake area, Bentley is just north of Sylvan Lake, a small town, and uh, they have the ski hill, which I'll show on this presentation. But why are we talking about uh, ski hill, Michelle? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked, Michelle. I'm going to tell you, Michelle. Well, what I didn't know was that uh, they're called Medicine Hills for a reason. The Rocky Cree what calls it the medicine hills because they're very sacred grounds for them so uh this presentation that i have up it was put together by by sandra she is a metis in the area she has horses and does uh all sorts of like outreach for folks with disabilities uh with horses and such as well just a really great person and really um took to heart that whose lands that she's on and who needs to be at the tables when talking about these conversations. Now, I grew up in Sylvan Lake. Um, I know how non-Indigenous friendly it was. Uh, it still is, in my opinion. Um, I have a 30-year 
high school reunion coming up May 4th. And I'm, you know, I have most of my, my friends blocked, or I guess they're not my friends. They're um, people I grew up with who, you know, really liked racist things. And I just didn't want to have them at all in my world because I knew they weren't open to hearing what I had to say. And I mean, I grew up in a lot of that anyway. Um, I'll never forget in grade three, having a so-called friend of mine doing a, a sleepover and everybody thinking I was going to be a sex worker. And of course, it wasn't until I was older that I understood because I was native, that that's why they thought I'd be a sex worker. And, um, you know, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to say it. I, it took me a long time to understand why they said that to me. So that's the type of people I grew up with and thought were my friends. And like an idiot took me a long time to realize that they were really mean and harmful to me, actually. So, um, so knowing that, knowing why there's so little people of color in central Alberta towns and such, the time I was growing up, um, this whole thing made a ton of sense to me that I'm going to show you. So um, there is, first and foremost, uh, most of you know, I really don't like talking to people who haven't read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the National Inquiry, Understand Treaty Relationship, because we are not having, like we are in two different totally worlds by not knowing somebody's history and not knowing that and, and not having respect and understanding for all of these things that I talk about. So um, first and foremost, there's actually a whole book that discuss this issue. And I'm going to show on my, my PowerPoint here, uh, the history of Alberta history. It's uh, the Medicine Hill Sacred Ground, uh, 13,000 years of history notes um, for folks who can uh, see my my screen. I'm just going to bring up the Amazon link here so that you can see that it you can order this book. And this name, this author, I actually had a look and they have tons and tons and tons of books that are uh, of Indigenous history. But this clearly is not an Indigenous author. So um, I I don't like people reading non-Indigenous authored books, but it really seemed like this was the best one for us to be putting out there for now. So when you read that, please remember you're looking through a settler colonial lens, not an Indigenous lens. And hopefully one day we'll see there. So anyway, this author is spelled J-O-A-C-H-I-M, last name F-R-O-M-H-O-L-D. So I don't know how you say the first name, but it's like Fromhold is the last name. And uh, Alberta History, the Medicine Hills, Sacred Ground, 13,000 years of history notes. And uh, that's just one of many books that this person has authored on Indigenous history. So that book is featured on the second part of this PowerPoint presentation. Um they give a little bit of a location about where Bentley is, where Sylvan Lake is, and a uh, little X where the sacred mountain or sacred, uh, sorry, the Medicine Hills uh, sacred grounds are, uh, the ski hill, basically. So the, the presentation itself, she has one that she gives about uh, the history of that area, about this, this hill called Signal Hill uh, to the Rocky Mountain Cree. And uh, kind of gives, there's these plots that show who owns the lands in a certain area. Um, now, I used to be a drafter, so I would not have chosen this. But, you know, I understand this is where it came from. Um, I probably would have drafted this a bit differently. But the at the end of the day, what their point is, is who owns the land where the Medicine Hills uh, are, are situated, which is the village of Bentley, the town of Bentley. They own it. So um, she in this presentation, she has this point about um, 1890s Alberta, Medicine Hills. Indians are now largely confined to reservations. Medicine Hills are now hunting grounds for several Indian groups. Some of Bobtail's uh, Cree Mountain or Mountain Cree move into the area after abandoning the reserve at Hobima. 
east of the hills are the Ermskin, uh, Louis Bull, and Samson bands. West of the hills are the Ochis and Sunchild bands who have not signed treaty. Uh, Ochis band has a settlement west of the hills. North of the hills is Buck Lake and Paul band, and a few from Fort Edmonton's bands still hunt in the area, especially from Alexis uh, and the Passachu bands. Um, in the 1890s, Medicine Hills, the Cecile family from Hobima yearly passed through the way to and from their hunting grounds west of the Rocky Mountains. Makes me wonder uh, my husband's connection there. Uh, the buffalo hunters shoot down from the ridges surrounding the site. No apparent structures were built and they have burial grounds that are there. They know that. Uh, the Red Deer Crossing land holdings take up for several miles above and below the crossing and the first village cemetery in south in operation an Aboriginal cemetery located immediately south of that from 1890 to 1893 was when that was established so that they, they knew this area had some sacredness. Uh, reported but unconfirmed graves, rock covered of weathered and um, sandstone, reputedly larger than the largest graves in Site 1, located what well, it's just going on about how many graves that there are and that at least two chiefs they know are in that area as recorded from that author of that book, who is a researcher. Um, Rainy Creek, there was a 40 foot high ridge projecting halfway across the creek uh, and terminating in a point. This proved to be an old beaver dam. It was named Indian Point. There are many Indian artifacts in the area from which Fred built part of an excellent collection. Many years later, Fred loaned his collection to a local doctor who took it upon himself to donate it to the University of Alberta in his own name, rather than returning it to its rightful owner, which is hysterical because the Bentley Historical Society Committee thought it was important to say this in 1982, but who really is the rightful owner of Indigenous artifacts, but the actual nations themselves. So I just Settler colonial racism is so funny to read once you read once you realize what you're seeing. Anyway, um, the Ochis band held sun dances on the west side of the hills along to the present Highway 51 route. Um, Bob Campbell's farm, Buffalo Pound, they would watch for the buffalo as they came down to the lick. Then they would chase the animals up the valley to the pound and kill them. The Indians had dug a ditch to lower the water in the slough so that they could build a catching pen. There was a cram and a curling pit. In the summertime after the animals were butchered, they would be cut into pieces. Yummer. Okay. The town of Bentley use land use acknowledgement. This I found really funny reading because I, I just skimmed through it for folks who are watching, you can pause it. Um, but it basically talks about the EUP, which is supposed to be Alberta's uh, energy governing body that doesn't actually do anything but um, exploit the land and never does Indigenous consultation. It did mention that there's like deer, bears. Well, I, I'll just read this whole part to you, actually. Um, in 2008, the town received a letter from the author of that book regarding work that he had undertaken in the Medicine Hills area with the recommendations to consider the area should be um, given protection as both, both a natural area and a cultural heritage area as it would be considerable benefit to the town of Bentley. And then they talked about an EUP uh, drilling program to be approved in the Sunset Hill um, the letter also mentions historical significance, cultural importance to be considered in some of the sites, mentions the deer, bear, bald eagles, elk, and unique plants. Also, a number of seasons, springs, a sizable portion, an underground lake, presumably aquifer underlying the hills. The intention of the letter was to state that drilling would adversely affect the springs, mentions that the Medicine Hills to be a site of particular importance to, they say, Aboriginal peoples, because this was written in 2008, one of the most significant areas in western central Alberta. Historically, the medical, the Medicine Hills lied between the territory of the uh, Mountain Cree, the Mountain People Division of the Western Cree, consisting of a number of Cree and Nakota bands. Cree occupancy of the area can be documented and having existed by 1730. 
and likely as early as 1650. The Blackfoot, I'm sure, would dispute that. <laughs> the names of the bands and chiefs are known for this time period, and the history of the bands and band members are known in detail from uh, 1750 on. So again, these are settler colonial um, you know, documentations. So just to be really, really clear, and that uh, this land that they were on, they never acknowledged it as their land. They're just like, oh, there's a couple of significant points here. <laughs> States that the Medicine Hills were considered special interest to the uh, Mountain Cree for several reasons. They have religious association. They provide a height of land where religious fast meditations and vision quests were undertaken. Uh, location for religious events and undertakings. I love the way settler colonials kind of frame that. So at least now we know what we're going to be reading in that book when we all order it, right, folks? <laughs> um, contain a lot of uh, locations that are have special religious significance. This includes at least um, one water site, uh, referring to the spring, and at least one site, I don't know what those mean, as they stand out to lone outcrops, which give them uniqueness, recognized by Indigenous peoples, and compare that of Antler Hill, which was known to know a place of worship. Uh, the area reputedly contains a number of burials. Two chiefs are known to have died. It is not inconceivable that they were buried in this hills. Uh, on October 16th, 2008, which very coincidentally was my father-in-law's first birthday with him not being alive. He had just recently passed, um, but that's his birthday. So a letter was sent by the town of Bentley regarding the Omer's energy proposal to drill sweet uh, gas wells at the southwest corner of Township uh, 20, Range 40. Um, nope, I said that wrong. That's embarrassing. Anyway, in that area. The letter later stated to town council that their meeting held on October 14th considered a proposal from Omer's Energy and considered the Medicine Ski Lodge, the Medicine Lodge Ski Club's uh, opposition to the drilling of a well, the proximity of the proposed well to the ski lodge. So basically, settlers were saying, well, you don't want your energy development around our um, where we go skiing. It's really what it comes down to. So, uh, so this is what it looks like today. I, uh, I, I was there at the base of it where you can see that's where you kind of drive up to. And um, it's like the biggest bunny hill in the world. And I don't know, but apparently um, settlers have been skiing here since the 60s. So um, a little bit of a, a map of, of where it looks. It's really quite cute. Um, now what I found really interesting, Sandra was saying that there was like 200,000 people that came through this rock concert in the Blindman Valley in 1981. She said that they're still finding bottles of beer and bottles that were from that in, in that area, uh, which is really sad to show you, you know, what, what happens when people are just allowed to drink, um, Authorization for the acquisition was through bylaw, blah, blah, blah. The sum of $1 reads three times in February 3rd, 1958, and was signed by the mayor and secretary. So I guess I'm assuming that was the transfer to, for the ski hills. Oh, this one really pissed me off. So in the past, uh, this publication is um, more for research. Um, anyway. The ERCB, which is basically those folks, the Alberta regulating body that determined whether or not things would go through, just outright said Aboriginal have no rights to object. Um, they are the sole right to determine what constitutes uh, an Indigenous group. So like this was the type of barriers that were set up for Indigenous people to never have say in this. Um, it's so it's disgusting that ERCB was the sole agent to determine what rights Indigenous had, contrary to the Canadian Supreme rulings. Um, this is really important because this is about Alberta thinking they have jurisdiction over Indigenous people when they don't. They think they have jurisdiction over <laughs> Canadian Supreme Court rulings. Like this, this is the type of racism that there is here and the type of um, defiance that comes out here in Alberta. Um, so this area here is uh, Township 20, Range 
uh, no, I got that wrong. Sorry. Um, Township 40, range two, west of the fifth meridian. And we're in section 20 in the northwest corner of it. That's what you're looking at right here. Uh, this was uh, auctioned acreage at the bottom of the ski hill. This site was visited by a uh, chief standing on the road. And we know that there are artifacts and ceremonial sites on file regarding this land. But as you know, Canada has determined what they think is private land without Indigenous consultation and certainly without consent. And if we go back, um, you can just outright read it, the ERCB, just they determine who has, you know, what constitutes an Indigenous group, let alone who has rights. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, so this is what I used to draft. These are the types of things that I used to draft once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, what we're looking up at here is a subdivision part of the previous um, sky that we we had seen. And, you know, luckily, there's a copy of this available. So there was a petition for bike trails, uh, more bike trails in the Medicine Lodge ski hill. Um, put together a campaign by Red Deer's Realtor. Why is this important? For money. That's why we want that. So imagine people just putting together a petition for more bike trails over, you know, your grandma's grave. So there was a, a public notice of an engagement in regards to this master plan of the ski lodge and the town of Bentley are the current owners, but at this meeting, there was no mention of the graves, none. So that was really upsetting to the indigenous communities around there. Um, another one, master plan, McElhaney. <laughs> anyway, transcripts were requested four times for this public uh, notice and, and community engagement session, which I guess uh, to that, time that Sandra sent this to me was not given. They have their economic development partner and, and meeting host. And uh, of course, Lacombe County in their master plan created for the Medicine uh, Lodge Ski Hill. This was published on September 14th um, about further development. So uh, master plan is available at the town of bentley.ca if you want to have a look at this master plan. And so on Tuesday, I went out as uh, requested to go out to this um, this event to see at what it was going to be like to have all these different. Um, there was a, a chief there from one of the nations. There were many old elders. Most of the elders were from Ochis and uh, and talked about. Uh, where they knew the graves were, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, who else was there was the mayor of Bentley, uh, one of the town councillors, and like the city admin guy. And he's mentioned here, Mark uh, For Fortress, For Fortier. He was uh, the main organizer. So I got to meet them. Very nice, lovely people. Um, you know, very much upset that the Cree think they have any jurisdiction. So that was disappointing to see some of that, some of those answers, the way people were. Um, the ski lodge, obviously, they were the host and they were lovely people and had a nice fire. And so anyway, Sandra wants me to tell everybody, these are the folks that you need to contact uh, when it comes to this issue. If you want to start a relationship with the town of Bentley with the county of Lacombe with Medicine Ski uh, Medicine Hill Ski Club and of course neither well an, I, I think there was a representative from the indigenous uh, from Alberta the Alberta Indigenous Ministry so at least somebody was there not that I have much stock in that but so yeah that was a PowerPoint presentation I'm really glad I could share that with you um I just, okay, so back to being a witness. I think it's important to acknowledge the gravity of the ski hill, the lodge, and the town and the administrator from the town wanting to have these dialogues 
wanting to include Indigenous people for the first time rather than excluding them. That was a really important. Um, the elders that were there that had knowledge of where graves were and that, you know, they spoke very passionately about how, how unacceptable it is that there's a ski lodge there. And uh, one of the, the, the only counselor that was there uh, was a female and she was very defensive. There was a lot of uh, fragility that I had seen coming from the settlers because uh, even the, the mayor at one point said, well, we're not here to change land titles. And uh, so it was really disappointing to see that, uh, you know, fragility, that defensiveness coming out in a lot of the things that were said. Um, a lot of, well, you know, there's three generations here, so we're tied to this land too, which may very well be, but they still don't see themselves as treaty partners. And they certainly don't see them as having, um, you know, deferring any type of authority to Indigenous peoples. So that was beyond disappointing. It's just regular settler racism that I'm quite used to from central Alberta. Um, you know, that's not to say they weren't nice people. Of course, they were nice people. But at the end of the day, they are unrelenting when it comes to uh, Indigenous rights. They they don't recognize them. They see their their laws as more so, which is too bad because I really got the impression from uh, the chief, as well as the elders that were there, that they were really there to try to give that free information and save the the graves from being bulldozed and having a sacred place for people to continue to use because that was taken away with the private, um, all the private landowners surrounding that area. That was another component was Sandra and I were talking and there were a lot of landowners that were very um, angry, defensive, and not wanting to be a part of any sort of Indigenous consultation or Indigenous outreach at all when it comes to any of their rights. Because I think at the end of the day, settlers know that they actually have no jurisdiction to those rights. The fact that they've chosen to pay mortgages on these uh, plots of land that were stolen from Indigenous people, you know, that it just it's just such a normal racist thing that happens here in in Canada as uh, settler colonials just have the privilege of believing they have sole rights uh, totally ignoring you know in this case over 13,000 years of history um just disappointing as always to see settler racism so in your face like that even though they don't like you know that that's the thing that I think people don't understand is that when I say racism People are thinking of, you know, folks in white hats. And that's not what settler racism is. It's what happened to me today at an event where it was like, well, all I'm hearing is blame from you. You know, completely ignoring the documentary that we had watched, completely ignoring the half an hour conversation I had about the 94 calls to action, the national inquiry, the uh, United Nation Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples that is a global, globally recognized uh, piece that the UN put together <laughs> and um, you know people saying they never even heard of it before and uh, that that's where we are I talked about the white goose flying report here in Calgary and people have no idea of any of this um, because I was uh, in Sylvan for a family gathering I was talking to my little nephew who's all white and he said he had no idea that the Beaufort Towers were a part of Calgary's public art program and how disrespectful it is. And, you know, these are our proud Germans who came here, who are, you know, strong in their being a part of this land, but they know it's wrong to have indigenous burial sites as an art project on an outskirts of town. Like it, it's so insulting. I can't even put words to it. And yet it's just so such normalized racism here. And that's the the nice people that you're constantly dealing with, where it's like, well, oopsies, oopsie daisy, off to church, big deal. That's racist settler colonialism. And it's in my face all the time. And people just think it's cool. It's okay. And that's what Canada is. We could be neighbors, but racist settler colonials won't let you <laughs> they won't let you be nice people to each other and and live in harmony and have 
like jurisdiction. They don't allow that. It's their way only. And that's what the movie that we were talking about was anyway. So it this it's been a very reoccurring theme for me this week. Um, you know, meeting folks, especially, I mean, if you listen to my last podcast, you heard me talk about Palestine and how clearly people don't get land acknowledgements, what that means and settler colonialism at all, let alone their racism that's attached to it all. So um I just think it's really important that I kind of frame all of that together because, but basically the town is saying they're not going to develop that area. And Sandra rightfully, and the Crees are like, actually, we're pretty worried about what you want to do. Um, Mark really made it clear to me that what he wanted to do was say, Hey, this area is whatever a chief so-and-so buried here. And this is his grave and have like a, you know, plaque from some grant that tells you about reconciliation. Which is great. We want that. But we also want um, an understanding it's not okay to ski over graves, you know, and, and I know that's a really hard part for people to understand. And uh, I know the town and and the ski lodge also want to expand the area to have like walking trails and such and to allow indigenous people to have areas that they can do vision quests if they so choose so i from my point of view as a witness it was really important to have that collaboration um our are our counselors uh following trc 57 fuck no but at least the town admin um mark knows some of this history now so now i think that there will be a bit of a change in that relationship i'll never forget when i ran municipally and i was in a room full of municipalities and they were talking about new changes in in the provincial legislation about how there needs to be outreach to indigenous groups and how people said well then we'll just vote them out because that was when the ndp were in and they wanted they obviously a bunch of racist rednecks in the in the room that were like, well, just get the UCB back in so that we can have our way. And that's what they've done. That's what they did. So the mayor was very passionate. Uh, he said that there was a proposal that was being asked to be developed in on the ski lodge. And that's why he was being approached. And he said, uh, no, no, we, we don't plan to do that. Now, good for him. Uh, the female counselor, she was very fragile and she spoke very passionately about her daughter getting married at the bottom of those slopes. So she has an invested interest to keep that from being developed as well. And uh, so I thought what I did here really clearly is that they don't want it developed. But what like just aside from what I witnessed and aside from what we talked about, I know as soon as developers get the word no, they don't like that. They have a lot of money they want to invest. So I would highly suspect that the mayor and the person, this this female, will be replaced by yes people very in the next election. And uh, of course, no one like of the town of Bentley, completely oblivious, worse, probably would agree with them that they would rather um, give somebody a developer money and um, destroy Indigenous ways than to you know work with the people so we'll see i don't know i don't i i have sandra's concerns of what's about to be developed without um real meaningful consultation and certainly no stopping so um i think that book is really important to kind of illustrate that there is an invested reason to stop any development there and i'm sure that the surrounding uh folks who uh own those properties would very much hate this podcast hate what I had to say and hate the way I've tried to uh, frame this but at the end of the day we've always heard colonial points of view we've never heard indigenous points of view and at the end of the day this is stolen land and there's not proper consultation there's certainly not a veto and the truth is indigenous people own these lands and since you all broke treaty we technically have the right and jurisdiction to kick you off our lands we just don't we just want to work with you so I wish people Rather than having this attitude that we all have to die and we have to commit genocide, we could just work together. And it's really unfortunate that Canadians still don't get that and still just uh, exert their own rights and their own laws that they brought from Britain here. You know, that's still where we're at. 
So I wanted to give you a, a bit of a, I want you to follow that. Um, I had been sharing it on my social media for folks interested, and I'll try to keep updating on here as we go so that that way people have an idea. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention was that the book club is uh, for 2024, I have put it together. So uh, we're going to have Lessons on Legitimacy by Sean Carlton for those who need white men to tell you uh, about Indigenous issues because you can't hear it actually from Indigenous women. <laughs> That's on January 8th, February 12th, Disarm, Defund, Dismantle, Police uh, ab ab Abolition in Canada. Oh my God, I couldn't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you know, here's the thing about police abolition is that Brave Dog Society was the, the um, you know, policing for this area. And uh, I think it's really important that it should say settler police abolition, because, you know, police abolition, ignoring Indigenous people is kind of well, like Indigenous erasure is kind of the normalized thing. So I'm curious to read it, see what it's like. Um, I think it's important for Black History Month as well, uh, especially seeing what, what's happening with Taylor McNally and Adora Dofour here in Calgary. It's really important we talk about anti-Blackness as a part of this. So that's why February, because it's Black History Month, and that's a Canadian uh, book we should all be reading about. And not to mention that settler policing has killed our people and put us in shitty justice systems. So... March 11th, Canada as a settler colony on the question of Palestine explores Canada's Palestine relations through a settler colonial lens and reflects on migration, orientalism, and critical race theory. So, and that's from the University of Alberta. On April 8th, we're going to do Indigenous Women and Street Gangs Surveillance Narratives, uh, Indigenous Women and Street Gangs by Amber, Bev, Chantel, Jasmine, Faith, Georgina, Henry, and Robert. So well, that'll be interesting. In May, we're going to do Doing Things the Right Way, Dene Traditional Justice in the Northwest Territories by Joan Ryan. Uh, June, we're going to do Two-Spirit, Stories, Sex, and Ceremony Behind It All by Alicia Two Bears. On July 8th, Truth Telling by Michelle Good. On August 12th, we're going to do Killing the Wittigo. Indigenous culturally based approaches to waking up, taking action, and doing the work of healing by Suzanne Method. And yeah, so that'd be interesting. October, or sorry, September 9th is Unbroken by Angela Skerritt. And October 4th, Moon's Moon of the Turning Leaves by Wab Rice. Uh, he was just here in Calgary for. Uh, the book, uh, what do they call that? Indigenous Reads. No, 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 no. The major festival that we have here for books. He was brought in here. I can't believe it's, I can't believe I can't remember. Wordfest, Wordfest. Uh, November 11th. Okay. There is Canadian code talkers that were instrumental in the wars. And I was given a book of Code Talker by Chester Nels, Nez. So I'm going to read that one, even though it's more American based. I do know we had Canadians. I was just, I haven't been given that book. So that's not the book I'm reading. <laughs> on December 9th, we're going to do Reflections on Allyship by Andrea Maynard as been released alongside the Esteem Collaboration, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, all of the proceeds from each sale go to the Moose Hide campaign as well. So I think that's really important. And then if you reach out to me, I will send you the Zoom link if you are interested in being a part of our book club. And if not, that's okay. Um, I hope you follow along or at least consider reading those books anyway. So I appreciate everybody listening to what I had to say today. Some, uh, you know, things that matter to me, obviously, is tomorrow is the trans Transgender Day of Remembrance. I'm going to uh, sit at the fire they were going to have a sacred fire that was organized by uh, one of our trans activists. And um, yeah, I'm going to sit there for a couple of hours uh, while we acknowledge that. Uh, today was a Palestinian march again. We have some great news. Wesom was, the the charges were stayed. Um, 
So what that means is that for the next year, they're going to be watching him and looking for a reason to charge him. Um, regardless, he can at least organize. So I know he was there today. And I think it's important to acknowledge that um, there was no reason for these charges to have been put together at all. And the fact they didn't drop them and they stayed them. Um, I'm a little annoyed with what's going out on Twitter because some of the organizations, one that I'm really mad at, said that the charges were dropped. And that's not what was told by everyone else is that they were stayed. There is a big difference between dropped and stayed. So I'm hoping that they will be dropped or we will get an update that they were dropped because being stayed is not okay. Cause that just means for the next year, he's still under surveillance anyway. <sighs> um, yeah, so we, we did listen to the national action plan on the violence against women and gender-based violence for November's book club. Well, let me tell you, that is a hot mess of racism. You know, after reading the national inquiry and it being so thorough and so real and so um, based in trauma understanding, coming to this and like some of the first words on there are stakeholder. And that's a racist term for folks who don't know another, you know, regular racist settler term that everybody's okay with. Um, it was so poorly written and, uh, you know, folks noticed details like their 2S LGBTQ acronym not being consistent throughout it. It was written quickly so it, it's just so disappointing. We decided, although it's 400 pages and we read the first 200, it was just too boring and stupid and awful and not the national inquiry to continue. So we just encouraged anybody to read a book and tell us about it for December 11th. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I started reading a book. I got to get finished here about um, the Northwest Territories. So and diamonds and exploration i'm it's so hard because this uh documentary i just was a part of for the calgary justice film festival was talking about you know development and it ruining water and no real consent when it came to indigenous consultation and that's just it, it doesn't matter where we're talking about it's a constant ongoing theme of canada and that's just what they do when everybody is okay with it. And that's racism. That's that racism settler colonial mentality that nobody challenges in this country. So anyway, I'm sure there'll be two or three books of different nations that are dealing with that. And anyway, encourage you to tell us about maybe your favorite book of the year, whatever it is, if you want to join us for December. Uh, the Reconciliation Action Group has been really great at trying to support the family that was attacked it uh, out in Cochrane with the Calgary Catholic uh, School Board, as well as the actual child getting attacked. Um, so that that's been really ongoing for us. I've, we also obviously support Palestine. So we've been putting out some uh, information about that as well. Anyway, I'm glad this podcast has always given solutions and cultural training and cultural first aid and all of them to create a safer space for Indigenous people of color, those with disabilities, and 2S LGBTQ to speak, according to the uh, 2023 Quality of Life report from the Nash from the Calgary Foundation, 88% of racialized Calgarians feel uncomfortable and out of place because of their religion, ethnicity, skin color, culture, language, accent, gender, or sexual orientation, which was up from 75% in 2022. 84% of racialized Calgarians, of course, believe racism exists with only 66% of non-racialized Calgarians. And it's so interesting because, you know, here I had a, a volunteer who was at this film festival and his, his opening words to me was, I hear a lot of blame from you. And I just can't help but think like he is probably part of the people, the 66% percent of non-racialized Calgarians that believe racism exists but doesn't understand he perpetuates it anyway thank you to authors uh, Cheryl Ward Chelsea Branch and Alicia Fritkin of here to help.bc.ca you can see what is indigenous cultural safety and why I should care about it 
Again, this is that cultural safety training, cultural first aid, cultural action tools. So please support work like that as part of your um, anti-racism training, reconciliation work, and settler understandings. I'm just lucky enough to highlight and repeat them here. Um, internal racism and lateral violence is another form of violence Indigenous and marginalized people experience by the structure of racism imposed on these lands. Fun story. I had this uh, Cree Roma person try to say it's okay to use the J word when talking about her Roma background. And I was like, no, no, it's <laughs> it's not okay. So again, this is that work of internalized racism. You know, if we don't focus on what's inside of us that we don't recognize we have prejudices of, we're not helping our, even ourselves. I, I tried to explain to them, I would never call myself a squaw just because I can't. And uh, they wrote something nasty and then deleted it. But just the way Instagram's notifications are, like, I, I can't unsee it. And even though she deleted it, whatever. So anyway, like, this internalized racism and lateral violence is an important part for any oppressed person to acknowledge. Because if you don't work on that, then we're just still throwing out hurt and throwing out trauma at people and I'm sure from her point of view it was oh my god how can she say she stands up for anti-racism when I identify as a j-word and you know but again this is internalized racism not being properly addressed we can go around calling ourselves names <laughs> it's that simple um just because a black person can use the n-word doesn't mean that that's how they refer to themselves all the time as not especially when we're in like you know, white coding situations, my God. Um, Donna Bevins, who is a Black author, or a Black amazing person, put together racialequitytools.org. So if you go into her resource files, this is so much, you know, information about racism, how anybody can't, you know, learn something from racialequitytools.org, I have no idea. But anyway, she has a whole section on what is internalized racism. So every so often, I will reread that in order to help myself from perpetuating racism uh, from uh, myself onto other Indigenous people. And uh, and just being trauma-informed in general, it's important. Anyway, uh, do's and don'ts for bystander intervention. So you're on the sea train, you see a Muslim person um, being mistreated by somebody, what do you do? So you go to afsc.orgs. And you go to the bystander intervention area and you read that and start implementing those resources. Again, these are solutions. It's just that some people are so committed to racism, they don't hear it and don't want to learn these things. Anyone who follows me, I would recommend Anti-Racism Organizational League for the City of Calgary giving a presentation on the journey of becoming an anti-racism leader. You know, these are simple things people can do if you want to do more, if you want to do better. Um, Calgary Black Lives Matter activists Taylor McNally and Adora Nofor are being legally targeted. Please go to Stop the Stack YYC to learn more and to help. Um, I had witnessed a bunch of folks attacking them, saying things like, oh, you're just trying to get attention. You know, I, I can't stress enough, I'm not going to speak for Adora and Taylor, but I've never met an activist that wants to be an activist, that wants to be at the center of attention. Um, it sucks. Your family, your friends, people you grew up with, your neighbors, they all hate you. And, and nobody wants to be that person that's hated. But unfortunately, we experience injustices so differently. And when we try to voice that, people attack us. So I can say when I see um, people attacking Taylor or Adora, like, I know you're not working on racism, anti-racism training. I know you have deep anti-blackness in you. I know because they're both women, you have sexism in you and you were immediately blocked from my life. Um, it It's sad. I, I did not realize how many people have violence against women, um, violence against black women, just because they hate, hate the color of their skin. So please stop the stack YYC. This is long history of, you know, government coming in to go after black people in order to justify slavery, in order to justify second class citizen 
Like it's just disgusting racism and how people can't see it and how have the audacity to post publicly that they think that Taylor and Adora want this in any capacity. I could just puke thinking about it. And I just know it's just a matter of time until they target me too. Anyway, Indigenous people have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas in reports, commissions, and public hearings, just so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. <laughs> they don't recognize the marginalized in their budget with Gender Equity Plus. If they're cutting violence prevention programs and services, Indigenous education, uterus health choices, gay straight alliances, lack of human rights for migrants, immigrants, folks with disabilities, know that your vote to that party directly negatively impacts marginalized people. Demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the multiple reports about child welfare reform, violence prevention, and now 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Provincially, we have the 113 Pathways to Justice, so all the blue voters should be holding their blue MLAs to account on that. Municipally, we have the White Goose Flying Report. Denying these reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in the educational, justice, health, and all institutions with multiple reports that say that. Demand changes from election platforms and politicians if they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, and sexism. They literally have zero business running. But this can also be much bigger than just politics. <laughs> you know, you are a part of a business. You are a part of a nonprofit. You're a part of a church. You're part of a sports club, some sort of community organization. You, too, have the ability to do better on all of these reports by implementing them. Uh, Google articles on how non-Indigenous people can become allies. Um, I also really want to encourage people who like are paying attention. AboriginalAlert.ca is a great way to learn about missing Indigenous people in our area. I also um, care a lot about, like, obviously everything is ongoing genocide from stealing our kids to not dealing with the drug crisis. And the drug crisis is something that I can't, I can't talk enough about how many people are dying because of poor policy when it comes to uh, this drug crisis that we're having. So I carry uh, naloxone and Narcan with me. Every Albertan can carry naloxone with them. If you are a status native, you can carry uh, Narcan with you. Anyway, it's really important that people understand the gravity of this, you know, from homelessness because of stolen land. Uh, 60 Scoop Indian Residential School to the trauma not being resolved from all of this colonial uh, violence. We now have these addiction issues in this area with no culturally appropriate solutions because of racism. So if you know someone who's using these substances, do not use alone. If you are using alone, make a safety plan with the National Overdose Response Service at 888-6888-NORS. You can also download the Brave or Doors app. There's also a Lifeguard app. If you're experiencing emotional distress after anything I talked about today and need to talk, you can call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They also have a website, hopeforwellness.ca. If more related to missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, you can call 844-413-6649. And you can go um, also to the 60 Scoop Indigenous Society of Alberta at ssisa.ca. The Indian Residential School Survivor Family Hotline is 866-925-4419. The Native Youth Crisis Hotline is 877-209-1266. For non-Indigenous, there are distress center lines in your area, usually a functioning 211, or you can call 833-456-4566 or text at 45645. You can also go to crisisservicescanada.ca and the kids' help phone is 1-800-668-6868. Uh, the 2S LGBTQ crisis supports uh, can be found at lifevoice.ca. 
Uh, Trans Lifeline is 877-330-6366. And the youth is 866-844-7386. Want to make it really clear, you matter. And tomorrow's day of uh, transgender remembrance is to honor and acknowledge all of those who died unfairly, unjustly, because of their trans identity. I can't uh, stress enough how much you matter and how much uh, the 2SLGBTQ community in general has helped me so much with unpacking misogyny and toxic masculinity. And I, I wish you knew how much you are needed to help uh, straight basics like me. <laughs> Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. This is self-care, Indigenous media representation, how I take my power back. I started this to speak without interruption, tone policing, leadership shaming, gaslighting, because so many people just don't want to hear an Indigenous woman's opinion, but sure like to tell us theirs, even if they know nothing about us, nothing about colonialism, the constant surveillance of our people, protests, vigils, and rights. I and many others share microaggressions. It's unacceptable anymore. Learn about being trauma-informed. Folks like me are dealing with internalized racism, gatekeeping, folks who survive off the status quo, folks who are still really in their trauma and stop people from doing the work and deplete personal resources. Internal and external racism is an everyday reality for me, Indigenous people, folks with disabilities, QT, BIPOC, and others. And I can't stress the grief that we're constantly under. Um... I wish people understood what being trauma-informed actually was. Anyway, Masi Cho to my ancestors, to my granny, who's up in heaven, uh, to my mom, what strength looks like through your example, to my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt, and my stepmom for showing me her Austrian culture and stepping in to, proud, to teach me to be a proud Calgarian. Uh, thank you to my husband. I... I appreciate him producing and editing the show as well. He's been my husband, childhood friend, father of our child, and my support on this journey of the Red Road, witnessing decades of racism and sexism. And to our child, we are blessed to learn from you daily, and we are honored you chose us. You give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. I just want to give a shout out to you for uh, earning one of the Change Maker Awards this weekend. Yeah, I'm so proud of you, Samantha. I hope my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that they will understand. Again, my native uh, Calgarian Patreon account is where you can pledge and support. Thank you, previous donors. If you value listening or watching and can, can afford to give, thank you. For those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com. Also, that's where you can also email me to get the Zoom link and the book club selection if you're interested as well. Uh, so thank you all who have been a part of this journey with me. I want to end by giving a side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not your dish. And my beautiful cousin would respond, or yet be in my dish. Thank you folks for listening.